compute the adiabatic flame temperature of propane burning with 250% theoretical air. You have to be good at balancing that reaction equation because a lot of these start these problems start with being able to balance it. So we have propane, C3H8, and we come in with oxygen and 3.76 to get the right balance of the nitrogen in air. And it goes to CO2. At this point, I can balance the carbon because there's only two places the carbons occur, one with the fuel, one in the CO2. So it's three and then H2O. And there's only two places hydrogen occurs, so I can balance the hydrogen at this point and it's four, and then I sum up the oxygen, so that's six, seven, eight, nine, ten on the right-hand side. I come over and put a five there, and then if I'm going to have more air than needed, this is stoichiometric air. Let me finish it out. Five times 3.76 N2, right? But if we have 250% theoretical air, we modify this by putting a 2.5 here, True. And then we're going to have some excess oxygen, 1.5 times 5 times O2. And that nitrogen is boosted a little bit by 2.5. Well, not just a little bit, but 250%. So the nitrogens are balanced. So there you go. Now we have the uh, reaction equation, and we want these ends. So if we you can rewrite it so it's nice and clean. C3H8 plus 2.5 times 5 is 12.5 O2s. 2.5 times 5 times 3.76 is around 47 N2s. It goes to 3 CO2s. Why am I rewriting it? It says individual numbers in front of each of these is more useful than the product of three terms okay uh, plus four h2o's plus how many oxygens do we have left over 7.502's and the 47 n2's so we know the ends now those coefficients in our balanced reaction equation so we go to calculate the adiabatic flame temperature and uh, the energy balance which we had written in the previous slide. What we have to do is we have to calculate the sum of the stoichiometric coefficient times that enthalpy for each of the products. And that enthalpy for each of the products is going to be the enthalpy of formation plus the enthalpy at that adiabatic flame temperature minus the enthalpy at the reference 298. I'm going to close and put a square bracket, square bracket. So that's our sum over all our products. And the, we're, we're going, whenever you see adiabatic flame temperature, the fuel is not coming in hot. Just assume the fuel is at 298. So and the air comes in 298. So the sum over all the reactants of the stoichiometric coefficient times the enthalpy formation, and, and that delta H is zero because they're coming in, everything's coming in, and the reactant's 298. So this equation, what you do is, is you need to solve for adiabatic flame temperature right there. So if we write it out, you'll have zero is equal to, for the products, 3 times the CO2. What's the enthalpy formation? Carbon dioxide, negative 393520, plus the enthalpy of CO2 at some unknown adiabatic flame temperature, minus the molar enthalpy, 9364, plus 4 times water vapor. Water vapor has negative. 241820 plus enthalpy of H2O vapor at some adiabatic flame temperature minus 9904 plus 7.5. This is for the oxygen. The adiabatic, I mean, the uh, enthalpy of formation for oxygen zero, but we have 
O2 at some adiabatic flame temperature minus at 298 for oxygen. Plus for the nitrogen, 47. Enthalpy of formation, zero. Plus the enthalpy of N2 bar adiabatic flame minus the nitrogen, 8669, close. I'm just going to stop. Did I do the sum over all the products correctly? Do I have a minus sign anywhere, you know, incorrect? Do I, does it look good? All right. Then let's do the sum over the reactants. But um, I have an error right there, don't I? Isn't that supposed to be a minus, the sum over all the reactants? True? Yeah. So we'll put a minus. And now for the reactants, we're going to have one for the fuel. And the enthalpy formation of the fuel is negative 103850. And then the enthalpy formation of the oxygen, even though the oxygen's high, you know, 12.5. Whoops, let me put it here. Negative 12.5 times 0 minus 47 times 0 because their enthalpy of formations are 0. So unfortunately, what you have to do is you have to guess and iterate or you use a software tool to help with the tediousness of the calculation. And when you make this calculation, you'll find that the adiabatic flame temperature is around 1303 Kelvin. Do you want to see how I did it in Excel or not? Yes? Okay. I know it's bad. I don't know how much pedagogical value there is if showing you an Excel file where I already worked it out. But I'm going to try to see if you glean anything from it, okay? So here it is. Here's the Excel file. Let me scroll up. Scroll over. It's large, isn't it? Okay. Um, let me show you how what I did in this region right here. I got the reaction down. And so I know that I'm combusting propane. And I first get the equation where the coefficient in front of this fuel and the coefficient in front of this fuel and, or, or that term and then in front of the, it's really not, just put nitrogen there. It's not 3.76 times nitrogen. It's just nitrogen, okay? So, but anyway, then there's CO2. H2O, O2, and N2. So when I put in the fuel, I can see that I need a 3 in front of the CO2, and I need a 4 in front of the H2O. Once those are determined, you know, you can come over here and do a balance with an equation, and Excel can help you figure out uh, how many oxygens you have. That equation works only if there's no oxygen with the fuel. Otherwise, you have to be careful. Some fuels do have an O in it. And then uh, once you have the O's figured out, then this is just simply calculated. Once I have it uh, evaluated, then to, to, to put it for, let's say, 150% or 250% or 130% or whatever, it's pretty straightforward. You can just change it. Let's say 130% theoretical error. You can see it, it changed the coefficients. So you can get this to work quite well. Um, here you just see you're using 5 times 130. And then over here for the excess oxygen, it's 130 minus 100% times 5. So if I had 100%, what do you think the coefficient right here is going to go to? Better go to 0 because I have no unused oxygen, uncombusted oxygen. So with a little thought, you can get this to work. And so oh, I want to put it at 250. Great. Somebody says I want it at 170. Great. I can change it. Right? So that's the first two lines or three lines. Uh, again, I should change that because it's, it's just nitrogen there. Okay. Now, I put a sum over all the reactants. So I have a little table that goes right here, and it's just for the reactants. And you can see I'm doing the second law already, so skip the second law. <laughs> right there, what I just shaded is for the first law. Okay, so what we do is uh, you say this is my fuel, 
my oxygen, my nitrogen, and the sum. I copy down the coefficients, just copy down the coefficient, well, that there and there. And uh, you sum up all the coefficients when you want to go over here and do mole fractions. But right now, I don't need that sum for the energy balance. Ys are the mole fractions, right? I'll need that for a second law, but don't. We have to put in the enthalpy of formation, type it in, and tell a student helps me build where I can just make a call. Uh, maybe next semester I'll have it where I just make a call based on the fuel. There's my inlet temperature. It's the same as the reference temperature. I have no way of evaluating the H's at the reference or the inlet temperature for that fuel. So that fuel almost always is stuck coming in at 298, 25 degrees C. And the air can come in at you know 400, let me do this, 600 right here. See, so I have it copied down that temperature. If I change the top one, it's 600, 600. But, uh, then what would happen was for the oxygen, it would update and say what a H1 is, compare it to H at the reference, 298, and then do the delta H, and then do the coefficient times the enthalpy of formation plus delta H. So this is, the ter this is each component in that sum, N, enthalpy of formation, delta H. Let me go back and change this to 298. And you see that the delta H's are zero. The only thing we had was the coefficient times the enthalpy of formation for our fuel. The sum is there. Pretty straightforward for the uh, reactants. Now, what about the products? It's down in here. Uh, so I have to worry about CO2. Copy down that coefficient. Copy down that coefficient in front of the H2O. Copy down the coefficient. What did I just do there? Copy down the coefficient in front of the oxygen, as well as nitrogen. Put in the enthalpy of formation for the CO2. Usually I don't have to update that. I just put it in once, because all of our hydrocarbon fuels go to CO2 and O2, uh, CO2 and H2O. Uh, this temperature, t it could change. Maybe it comes out 900. Maybe it comes out 1,000. So they all come out at the same, but I, ch I changed that top temperature for T2. The reference is there. I can make a call. Enthalpy is a function of temperature for CO2. That's looking up in the table, which you have to do manually. Look up in the table. It's a call to a routine. Likewise, uh, H2O, and I put a little V for vapor. Just a reminder, this is H2O vapor, ideal gas. That's the call and then O2 and N2. You do the same, N times H of F plus delta H, sum it up, and there you have the sum over all the products. Does it look good? All right. Now, what do we do down here is this is Q over N sub F, so that's Q dot over N dot F, and you just see that that's just the difference between the, uh, the, uh, the, the sum over the products minus the sum over the reactants. It's a negative quantity. What does that mean? It means that it's not into the combustion chamber. It's, it's out. Um, this is a different problem here. I stop. Okay. We'll come back and do more on this problem. So, oh, I forgot to show you. How do I get that adiabatic flame temperature? Well, you could say 1,000 gives me a negative 66, blah, blah, blah. How about 1,500? Uh, it's now positive. I bracketed. I need to drive Q to zero. I need to drive Q to zero. So slick in uh, Excel, you go under data. True. Under data, you can do what if. Under what if, you do goal seek. And then it says... Oh, you, you already selected this value, which is cell E13, right? Okay, I want to, uh, no, no, I want to set this value right here, which is C18. I want to set that value to zero by changing cell E13. See that? Hit OK. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I'm sorry? 
go back. Let me do this. Hit OK. Here's 900. OK. So it's not zero. And I want to change this temperature such that this goes to zero right here. Is that so? I go to data, what if, goal seek. You just have to find where Excel has this function and set this cell C18 to zero by changing this input. And when I hit OK, it'll update it and it updates it right there. So the target was zero, the current value is zero. If you expand, you see that it's not just 13, it's, it's a bunch of digits, isn't it? So if I wanted to, I could uh, come down here, come back to home, and see, you know, put more digits out there. So 1,303.24. Do you really believe the 0.24 Kelvin? No, we don't believe that. Did that help? So without Excel, how would we go about Oh, you iterate by hand, and I would do what the bracketing. So what I would do is to this equation right here is I would put in a thousand. And I'd say, oh, this doesn't go to zero. It doesn't go to zero. It goes to some value. I'd put in fifteen hundred. It doesn't go to zero, but hopefully it goes to a value that's a changed sign. And now you did root finding in your numerical methods class. It's the bisection method if they call it that and so what you're doing is you have a plot you're trying to drive this function to zero as a function of x and uh, maybe one x was a thousand and you got a large negative value maybe the value of 1500 was a large positive value and now you can get an update on x by doing a little linear interpolation a little bit of work but it's well worth the work that little linear interpolation to get a better estimate of x. And that'll fall positive or negative, and you stay where you bracket it.